I just test the Q&A process so it works. Welcome back to Caltech Seminar Day. Our first session today is our ant is our ant-shaped planet with Joe Parker, Assistant Professor of Biology and Biological Engineering. Dr. Parker's scientific trajectory has been wonderfully Caltech. A fanatic about insects since he was seven years old, his childhood friends and even roommates, right, Joe, included scorpions, tarantulas, this is on record, giant African land snails and hissing cockroaches. Nice. He studied zoology and molecular biology and a few other things along the way by way of Imperial College in London, Cambridge, Columbia, and the American Museum in Natural History in New York, of Natural History in New York. At Caltech, he has co-founded Caltech's new Center for Evolutionary Science. You can find his mesmerizing Watson lecture, How to Deceive Society, an insect masterclass online and learn to say myrmecophile together with a group of people on the line. But today's talk will be Our Ant-Shaped Planet. A warm welcome to you, Joe. Thank you so much, Sandra. Hello uh, and welcome to all the Caltech alumni tuned in. My name is Joe Parker. I'm an assistant professor of biology and biological engineering. And what I'm going to try to do today is provide you really with a new way of seeing the world as something that has been sculpted by the tiniest and most overlooked of creatures the ants. Now, our planet is incredibly beautiful. And one of the reasons for this is that Earth has a biosphere, unlike the other planets in the solar system. Biosphere is this web of interconnected life forms that includes us and several million other species. And it's vital for our persistence on this planet that we understand how the biosphere functions and the contributions of these different life forms to it. So for nearly 300 years, biologists have been cataloging the biosphere and have discovered about 1.7 million different species. This is perhaps 10 to 20 percent of the total number of species out there. What's clear from our discoveries so far is that diversity is not evenly spread across the tree of life. OK, so there's over 400,000 species of plants, for example but only 8,000 species of amphibians and maybe 6,400 different species of mammals. But by far the largest group by a country mile really are the insects. Fully 1 million different species of insects have been discovered so far. And there may be somewhere between five to 10 million different species of insects out there in total on planet Earth. And due to this incredible diversity and huge abundance, insects comprise a massive fraction of the biosphere. They are the glue, really, that ties the biosphere together. And they provide innumerable essential ecosystem services, things like pollination, decomposition, acting as links within complex food chains and different habitats worldwide. And in so doing, they have major ramifications for effectively all ecosystem processes. Now, some of you, probably many of you who read the news are, are aware that there's evidence out there that insect populations are in decline. This is a story that's reached the popular press because if the insects are declining, it should start ringing alarm bells for the health of the biosphere as a whole. Now, the first evidence for insect declines was published a few years, and a, a few years ago, and it came from the efforts largely of amateur entomologists working in Germany who trapped flying insects in these malaise traps at different sites across Germany over about 27 years. Now, what a malaise trap is, you can see it's kind of like a tent with this central wall here 
and it flying insects bump into this wall and are trafficked up into this collecting cylinder up here. And what these amateur entomologists found was truly shocking. When they measured the biomass of insects collected by these traps, they found a drop of about 75% of total insect mass in just under three decades. That's incredible. Since this pub work was published, there have been comparable studies carried out in different parts of the world that have found a similar trend, raising the question of what's really happening to our insects. And it appears, perhaps unsurprisingly, that human impacts are responsible. Just two weeks ago in Nature, perhaps the most comprehensive study to date was published that showed insect declines over 20 years across dozens of sites across the globe. Um, and these declines were greatest where primary habitat had been converted to agriculture. So you can see in this graph here, the trans transformation of um, primary habitat to high intensity agriculture can cause an almost 50% loss of insect abundance um, and a 30% decline in species richness. And the impacts of land use ch change are most pronounced in parts of the world most affected by rising temperatures due to climate change. Okay, so that's really what we're doing to insects. And importantly, it's not just the insects that are suffering, it has ramifications for trophic levels higher up the food chain. Impacts don't just stop with insects because they are so integral to the biosphere. So since about 1970, it's been estimated that North America has lost about 3 billion birds. And if you look at what kinds of birds have been lost, it's the ins insectivorous ones, things like sparrows, finches, flycatchers, things that feed on insects naturally are undergoing these really dramatic losses. So something really troubling is happening with our insects, and we really should be paying attention. So the better we understand basic insect ecology and how we humans impact these organisms, really the greater our chances for averting what might be a potential ecological catastrophe. But if we're going to do this properly, we have to recognize that most insect diversity and abundance are not large charismatic things like moths and butterflies. They are very small bodied organisms with cryptic ecologies, things like calembola, rove beetles, and these are what we can refer to as ecological dark matter. They're tiny, extremely numerous, ubiquitous organisms that live down in the dirt and are easily overlooked. And by far the kind of most uh, pr pr prominent example within this ecological dark matter are the ants. Ants really are what we can consider a global social life force that exists on planet Earth in parallel to humans. Ants run terrestrial ecosystems by impacting numerous processes. So they control the function of entire habitats by preying on other organisms, outcompeting other organisms, in particular other invertebrates. They farm herbivorous insects like this ant here that's feeding on honeydew from these aphids. And the, they uh, um, enhance the populations of these plant feeding insects as a result with ramifications for the health of plants in these habitats. They control rates of leaf removal, seed dispersal, pollination. They protect plants, again, in return for nectar. So many organisms can strike bargains with ants for their own protection. And they modulate the entire structure of ecological communities and impact all of these second order processes, the flow and distribution of energy through ecosystems and the distribution of nutrients and impacting things like soil properties and biotubation, the, uh, the mechanical properties of soil, how aerated it is, and things like this. So you can really think of ants, tiny as they are, as ecosystem engineers that remodel entire habitats by controlling a huge number of different processes. Now, everybody's familiar with ants, right? They get into your house, they get into your jam jars, things like this. They're always kind of what you think of as pests in your garden, but planet Earth has for the longest time been free of ants. And this kind of rise of ants to ecological dominance is a relatively recent thing. The first evidence of ants occurs in a 99 million year old Burmese amber 
uh, back in the middle of the Cretaceous, dinosaurs are kind of walking around, running the show, and you suddenly get the appearance of the first ants. We think these organisms were social and able to form complex colonies um, at their first appearance in the fossil record, but they probably didn't evolve too much earlier than the mid-Cretaceous. What's really interesting is if you look at the relative abundance of ants compared to other insects in this Cretaceous deposit, the ants are very, very rare. They're far less than 1% of the total number of insects in this Burmese amber deposit, this Cretaceous deposit. Okay, other insects are much more common. And this same trend continues throughout the Cretaceous. So wherever we find ants in a fossil locality for the, about the first 50 million years, of ant evolutionary history, ants are pretty insignificant life forms, okay? And they're these kind of stem group, wasp-like ants. They don't have some of the characteristics of the ants that we find walking around our planet today. Then something appears to change about 50 million years ago. Suddenly ants in these fossil deposits start to, have started to increase in abundance. So they can be 6%, 10%, things like this. And if you fast forward to about 20 to 25 million years ago, this is Dominican amber, ants are now 40% of the total number of insects in this deposit. And of course, ants today are up to 25% of total animal biomass in some terrestrial ecosystems and globally have a biomass that's estimated to exceed all of humans put together. Okay. And so if I go into a tropical rainforest with my um, sieve, and uh, a gardening glove and start sieving leaf litter looking for insects, which is the kind of thing I like to do, really 95% of the insects I get out of the leaf litter are ants. They carpet the entire forest floor and it extends up into the canopy too. And this profusion of ants in terrestrial ecosystems extends all the way through the temperate realm up into the um, polar regions where ants are basically excluded. Okay, so planet Earth, where there's land is essentially cloaked with ants and ants are really running the show. So what has this meant for all of the other life forms on our planet? This Cenozoic, this rise of the ants over the past 50 to 60 million years must have dramatically reshaped our biosphere. Okay, so that we now live on this kind of ant shaped planet. Two important things to remember about ants. Ants are innately hostile to other organisms. This was one of the reasons for their success, the ecological dominance. If you look at this poor beetle here, I put into an arena with a couple of ants. As soon as the ants detect it, they attack it. So ants are only um, uh, uh, friendly to members of their own colony because they have a cuticular hydrocarbon chemistry on their body surface that they use to recognize members of their own nest. And organisms that don't match that cuticular hydrocarbon or CHC code are recognized as foreign and ants are innately programmed to be hostile and attack them and kind of turn them into food. Okay, so this uh, default aggression towards the outsider has been key for ant success. The other thing about ants is, of course, they are social. They form these extremely cohesive social units that can patrol really large sectors of the landscape. And what this means is that compared to solitary life forms, ants have an incredible competitive advantage. This is these superior entities, these super organisms that can command vast sectors of habitat and control the populations of solitary organisms that inhabit these areas. So what this means is for habitats as a whole, ants are really running the show. And if you're gonna make a living in the terrestrial um, realm, you have to have some way to deal with the ecological pressure of ants. And what this has meant over the past 50 million years or so is that modern ecosystems are the outcome of survivorship bias that's been imposed by this rise of ants. So many of you are probably familiar with this image that kind of depicts survivorship bias. Survivorship bias is this phenomenon where we only see entities which have passed through some selective process, okay? And we don't see entities which have failed to pass through the selective process. So this war plane analogy is the kind of the perfect one. We only see war planes that have been um, in battle 
that re returning back to military bases that have taken damage in parts of the plane which are not critical. We don't see parts of uh, uh, um, planes returning which have um, incurred damage in more critical regions. And you can think really of modern ecosystems exactly like this, okay? We only see life forms existing in ecosystems that have passed through this ant-shaped selective filter that have found some way to coexist with ants. And what we don't see are probably a myriad extinct life forms which could not deal with this rising pressure of ants over the past 50 million years and have been destined to a kind of historical um, extinction. And so really ants have split modern ecosystems into two parts, depending on whether you can coexist with ants and interact with them or if you can find ways to avoid them. So you can think of something like a forest or um, a meadow as a habitat with two parts. There's a central habitat space, which is ant dominated. And if you're finding organisms there, it's because they have some strategy to coexist with ants and interact with them. And then a peripheral habitat space, which is insulated from ants. So for example, you'll have species which are, take to the air and fly. Ants don't really do that unless they're um, reproductive, the queens and males. There are things that live under bark, subcortical species, things that bore inside plants, things that are saproxylic, that live inside logs that are kind of inaccessible to ants. And then the a diversity of fauna that live deep down in the soil that we know very little about. Okay, so that's one kind of sphere that you can exist uh, within uh, terrestrial habitats by insulating yourself from ants, just avoiding them. Then there are ephemeral species, things that produce large numbers of eggs and larvae and probably succumb to high levels of ant predation. So these are things like fruit flies, which lay huge numbers of eggs into fermenting fruit, which are really easy pickings for ants. They're just ant fodder. These are species that will pollinate flowers and feed on nectar, feed on decaying um, anim d d dead animals, cadavers. Again, these are organisms which probably do succumb to high predation from ants, um, but produce such high numbers of offspring that they're able to withstand this pressure and maintain stable populations. So that's organisms that exist in the peripheral habitat space. In the central habitat space, you have organisms that can defend themselves against ant aggression. So all of these organisms, like many insects and beetles, like the ones that I study in my lab, are able to chemically defend themselves against ants and create an enemy-free space around themselves, a kind of force field via either chemical or physical protection that keeps the ants at bay, okay? And so if you live in these central parts of the habitat, you probably have some strategy like this, okay? And it's driven really remarkable changes in insect chemistry, the evolution of biosynthetic pathways that can produce small molecule defensive secretions that um, uh, 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 um, pr protect these organisms in these ant-dominated environments. The other thing that you can do, I mentioned it earlier, is strike up some kind of deal with an ant and engage into a, a mutualistic symbiosis with it. So aphid, uh, uh, ants, you know, they need um, carbohydrates in their diet. And one of the things that's evolved during ant evolution is mutualisms with plant feeding insects, in particular sap sucking insects, such as aphids, that secrete honeydew as this kind of metabolic byproduct, which is carbohydrate rich. And ants want that carbohydrate fuel for their colonies. And so what many species of, of plant feeding insect have done is find ways to secrete effectively honeydew to ants, um, providing them with, with this uh, nu nutritional resource um, in return for protection against predators and parasitic wasps. Okay, so you get huge outbreaks of aphids and things like this on many plants because they're being protected by ants and otherwise they'd succumb to predation and parasitism from other groups of um, natural enemy insects. Now, the other thing that um, the final way to kind of make a living is to my mind really the most interesting, which is to get one up on the ants themselves and exploit the ant colony as a resource, this way of life called social parasitism. Now, this is an incredible phenomenon where often it's organisms which 
ancestrally were able to defend themselves against ants or formed kind of mutualistic partnerships with ants, which have turned the tables on ants and evolved ways to infiltrate their colonies, often tricking the ants through chemical and behavioral means into accepting them into their nests. So I'm going to show you a video of one of these um, organisms here. This little brown beetle in the bottom left corner, you can see far from being attacked by this ant, the ant is actually regurgitating liquid foods to this beetle, okay? And this beetle is so specialized for life inside ant colonies that its entire head has evolved into this kind of straw-like structure, and it solicits liquid food that's regurgitated from these ants and is found here and only here. It's obligately associated with these ants and has chemically tricked them into believing that it is a member of their own colony. So it can assimilate into... The social fabric of the nest. So you can see that ants, as well as impacting populations of many other species and kind of shaping their ecologies through things like predation and competition, ants themselves have provided a niche for the evolution of entirely new life forms, these mutualistic organisms and these socially parasitic organisms that number in the tens to hundreds of thousands. Now, the diversity of some of these associated species can be incredible, even with a single ant species. Many of you will have heard of army ants. Army ants, they're actually a real kind of phenomenon. Army ants are tropically dominant ants that form huge colonies of millions of workers that lack permanent nest sites and emigrate across the tropical forest floor, feeding on other arthropods, sometimes small vertebrates too. Um, and they really are the dominant predatory organisms of tropical ecosystems. Um, one of the most prominent genera that forms some of the largest colonies is uh, the South American genus Eciton. These colonies can number up to 10 million workers. And the, the only way you can think about this phenomenon like this is that this ant, this ant colony is, is a single superorganism. There's a queen, which is essentially the germline, and the workers are, are basically has somatic tissues, which are carrying out the functions of the um, superorganism as a whole. Okay, none of these ants, again, can live a solitary existence. Their whole reason for existence only makes sense in the context of this gigantic, ever-roaming colony. Um, so these army ant colonies are kind of um, patrolling the tropical forest floor. They occasionally stop to form um, nests out of their own bodies called bivouacs, which are incredibly intricate structures. The ants will thread their feet together to, perform, to um, produce this huge mass that um, will c collect at the bottom of a tree trunk or inside a, a hole in a tree or something like this. This is millions of ants kind of compacted together to perform. To, to, um, and, and this happens when the um, uh, queen is in re in her reproductive phase, so it's a pr protective structure that enables the queen to produce eggs and nurse the um, young larvae. And when that's happened, this bivouac will then break down again and transform into this roaming superorganism. Okay, so this single species of this ant can house or be associated with hundreds of other species that are obligate obligately related to this ant. So, for example, with a single Eciton species in, in um, South America, there could be 500 different animal species that are dependent upon it. So, for example, there are hundreds of species of mites belonging to 55 different families, which are specialized to integrate into different niches inside these ant colonies. Some of them phoretically attached to the ants, like this um, one here that looks like it's, the ant is wearing a hat. Um, some of them are specialized to uh, stick to the ant's feet. So this is the ant's foot here. And you can see this extension of the foot is actually a mite, which has evolved legs that look very much like the hooks on the ant's own feet. And this mite is found here and only here at the tips of the feet of this army ant and will actually form connections inside those bivouacs when the ants cluster together. Okay, so there's this kind of treasure trove of diversity of mites that are found only inside colonies of the single Eciton species. There are about 60 species of beetle, which again are obligately dependent on this single ant species. Some of them are color mimics, like this one here. Some of them are anatomical mimics, like this one here. 
there's several dozen of these rove beetle species which resemble the ants and walk in file with them across the tropical forest floor. The incredible thing is these ants are visually blind. They've only got like a single eye facet, so they could probably tell night from dark, but not much else. And we think that these beetles have socially evolved to socially integrate, assimilate into these ant colonies um, by not only tricking the ants' chemical nestmate recognition system, but also mimicking their tactile communication system. So these beetles have this ant-like body shape. So in the tiny mind of an army ant, when the ants antenate this beetle, it also feels like a beetle. And this is the selective force which has caused this beetle to transform its body shape into something more ant-like. There's really incredible adaptations of some of these beetles um, to kind of um, maintain a permanent association with the host ants. For example, this clown beetle here, you can see it's biting onto the ant's waist, the petiole, and forms this kind of fake abdomen. It's got the nickname the butt beetle, um, actually. <laughs> and um, if you view this ant walking from above, it just looks like this beetle is the ant's abdomen. So there's a specific niche at this specific position on the ant's abdomen that this beetle has somehow miraculously evolved to um, integrate into. Okay, so there's a huge range of invertebrates that are associated with a single ant species, but it doesn't stop there. There's also gills of vertebrates too. In particular, these um, uh, 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 multiple radiations of what are referred to as ant birds, which again, are obligately dependent on just this single dominant ant species. Ant birds make a living by feeding on insects that the army ants flush out from the undergrowth as they swarm through it. Okay, so if you're walking through the jungle and you hear a kind of cacophony of birds associated with um, an army ant colony, it's these ant birds. There are about 30 species of them in South America. One of the kind of knock-on consequences of having ant birds is that there are over 200 different species of butterfly which have evolved to feed on the droppings of the ant birds, which is truly remarkable. So you can see this whole ant colony of just this one single species is itself really this moving ecosystem of hundreds of species from different parts of the tree of life, um, all dependent on um, uh, um, these gi gigantic superorganismal colonies of eseton army ants. Okay, and I think this kind of really demonstrates just how integral ant colonies are to the diversity and functioning of ecosystems as a whole, because this is just a single ant species. And there are 14,000 different ant species worldwide, all of which have forged maybe not quite as extreme, but equally as important ecological relationships with other species. Now, Eseton, with you know one to 10 million workers, you can think about it really like a large mammal. Right? It's got a kind of huge biomass. It needs a huge foraging range. A single eseton colony requires about 30 hectares of um, uh, intact forest in which to forage. Okay, And so one of the consequences of habitat fragmentation and deforestation is, the, is that you lose these eseton colonies. And so this is a, um, an experimental plot in uh, Brazil where they've cut fragments of forest, right, which are kind of insulated from the surrounding areas. Um, and no matter what you do, no matter how big these fragments are, you all, one, of, one of the first species to vanish from them is Eseton and all of its associated species. So compared to the surrounding forest here, these fragments are absolutely silent because there's none of these ant birds, which are the things that kind of ring in your ears when you're walking through the rainforest. And so having intact, large tracts of intact forest is absolutely essential for the viability of just this one single ant species. And so when humans come along and cut these herringbone patterns of deforestation into the Amazon, you lose this ant and its entire ecological assemblage, which is um, in tow with it. So Eseton kind of, that example I gave you really just embodies the importance of ants and the fragility of these organisms in response to anthropogenic disturbances like um, changes in land use. But there's another way, a kind of opposite way that humans have impacted ants and the ecosystem, which is through it, the introduction of invasive ants into 
historically naive ecosystems. Now, most of the terrestrial biosphere, especially large continents, um, has evolved with ants over the past 50 million years. But island ecosystems like Hawaii, ants never got there. Okay, so these island e ecosystems, archipelagos, kind of encapsulate probably what the world looked like before ants came on the scene. But unfortunately, in many of these ecosystems, humans have introduced ants into them with really um, devastating effects for the naive flora and fauna. So the introduction of about 60 ant species over the past 200 years in Hawaii has decimated native um, populations of insects, plants, arachnids, and even things like vertebrates. So in Hawaii, where you have many ground nesting birds, these birds have never evolved to be around ants and their chicks in the nest are just, you know, it's open season on these chicks if you're one of these invasive ant species and that causes nest failures and the decimation of ground nesting bird populations. A really incredible example of kind of humans conducting their own rise of the ants experiment is seen on Christmas Island, which is dominated by these land crabs. The introduction um, just two decades ago um, of the yellow crazy ant, which is a super colony forming ant, um, really decimated these ant populations, the, the, um, the, the crab populations. The crabs succumb to the ants formic acid spray. And in just two years, it transformed forested parts of Christmas Island into these ant uh, crab graveyards, which is incredibly sad. And of course, it doesn't end there because the crabs are kind of integral to the functioning of these ecosystems. Usually, these crabs scavenge for seeds on the forest floor. And so you get this kind of really open understory and this really dense forest canopy. Um, but by killing off the crabs, the um, uh, um, canopy opened up and the ants also kind of, they, they farmed these um, scale insects that produce honeydew um, that cause fungus to grow in the tree canopy that killed the trees. So the canopy opened up, the um, trees died. This caused, led to a loss of birds. And then the removal of um, crabs from the um, ground layer caused this huge understory, to, this dense understory to appear which was then invaded by giant African land snails, which themselves were an invasive um, non-native species. So the forested parts of this environment have been kind of completely transformed through the introduction of just this single ant species. And it's important to kind of think about these invasions really as accidental experiments. The introduction of ants to these naive ecosystems it's absolutely devastating, but it's very informative because it tells you probably what's happened to our own biosphere, the rest of the biosphere, and how it's been shaped by ants. Over the past 50 million years, where we find ants in kind of natural contexts, these are, again, these habitats that pass through this ant-shaped selective filter, which shaped planet Earth. Okay. So... I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in my lab to understand ants and their interactions with other species. Um, we are fascinated by this kind of ecological centrality of ants within the biosphere. We want to understand both at a mechanistic and ecological levels how ants forge interactions between species and the roles these interactions play in the stability of ecosystems. So, you know, as you all know, Caltech is down here in Pasadena, and we have at our disposal this incredible extension of Caltech, this laboratory that we can call the Angeles National Forest, where my lab conducts experiments and exploits a naturally occurring um, ecologically dominant ant species to address how ants in interact with other species and, and what role they play um, in in um, uh, ecosystems as a whole. Um, if any of you have been hiking within um, the Angeles forest, you may have bumped into this ant species here. This is the velvety tree ant. It's the it's a native ant to this part of the world, um, and it's ecologically dominant. It kind of runs the show in the mountains, San Gabriel Mountains, north of campus. 
it forms huge colonies of several million workers um, that really cloak the forest. So wherever you find some like water or a creek um, that's kind of got some water in it most of the year round, you will find this ant in profusion. Um, they form trails that extend across the landscape for hundreds of meters. Um, and the entire forest really is split up into these sectors that are patrolled by these individual mega colonies of just this one ant species. And it's kind of an incredible um, uh, example of a kind of a keystone species which controls the populations of tens to hundreds of other species. This is a kind of breaking into one of these colonies. You can just see how incredibly um, numerous these ants are. Again, these are all products of just a single queen inside this nest. Uh, here's a video of two of my grad students, Julian and Tom, excavating one of these nests. And you can see there's just millions and millions of these workers. And they all produce this alarm pheromone, sulcatone. So it's extremely pungent when you break into these colonies. But they're incredibly interesting, fascinating, um, and ecologically important component of the um, biosphere in this part of Southern California. Now, Limatobum, this velvety tree ant, is kind of, yeah, we can refer to it as a, as a keystone species. It controls populations of hundreds to thousands of other species and is engaged in obligate interactions with hundreds um, of symbiotic species. So, for example, there are these mutualistic species, like the ones I mentioned to you before, that produce honeydew, this carbohydrate-rich um, food source in, res in, in response for, in exchange for... Um, protection and defense. So these are things like aphids, scale insects, gall wasps, they all produce these secretions and so the ants protect them. And this maintains the populations of a diversity of these kinds of insects. And then counter to that, there are lineages of social parasites which make a living inside the hostile colonies of these ant, uh, of, of this uh, of these limatobum ants so there are multiple lineages of these rove beetles that we study in my lab that have evolved chemical and behavioral tricks to infiltrate these nests and are oblig obligately dependent on them and act as these freeloading species that contribute nothing back to the colony i'll give you an example of one of these species that we study quite intensively in the lab is this beetle here skeptobius if you put Skeptobius into an arena with one of these ants, you'll see it kind of magnetically drawn to the ant and it'll climb on top of it. And the ant is seemingly cool with, with this. It kind of stops moving and is really subdued and seems completely fine with Skeptobius mounted on top of it. What's, actually, what's Skeptobius doing when it's there? Well, you can see Skeptobius is biting onto the ant's first antennal segment, okay? And this, this is anchoring the beetle's body on top of the ant, and it's using its feet to smear against the ant. It scrapes its feet against the ant, and then it smears its feet over its own body. Hopefully, you can see that while I'm playing this video. Okay, so we refer to this behavior as grooming. It's effectively grooming the ant and then smearing its feet over its own body. Why would Skeptobius possibly be doing this? Well, what Skeptobius is doing is it's stealing those cuticular hydrocarbon nestmate pheromones from the ant and applying them to its own body. It's evolved to shut off its own endogenous cuticular hydrocarbon production. So it's this chemical blank slate, effectively the stealth intruder inside this colony. But by the, through this grooming behavior, it horizontally transfers the ant's pheromones onto its body. So if you take this beetle and this ant and separate them, drop them into hexane and extract the cuticular hydrocarbons off the body and run them through a gas chromatograph, this is what you'll see. Each one of these peaks here is a single cuticular hydrocarbon ranging from carbon 25 to carbon 35 in length. And you can see that the profile of the ant and the beetle are almost identical to each other. Okay, so through this grooming behavior, Skeptobius is able to achieve perfect chemical resemblance of the ant and achieve nestmate status and acceptance into the in, inside the colony. So these ants never attack this beetle and it's recognized and accepted by them and is found there and only there. Okay, you don't find Skeptobius anywhere else except colonies of this one Limatopum ant species.
And so we're really interested in these kind of obligate interactions between ants and other insects like Skeptobius and dissecting them at a mechanistic level. So I showed you in that previous video that Skeptobius is magnetically drawn to the ant, climbs on top of it. And we are interested in understanding this from a, a chemosensory and neurobiological perspective. What is it about the ant that attracts Skeptobius to it? So we um, are able to kind of reconstitute these interactions in these arenas and use machine learning and machine vision methods to explore the behavioral interaction. So if you put Skeptobius into an arena with an ant, you can see it climbing on top of it and doing this grooming behavior. And you can just measure how far apart these insects are over a period of hours, in this case, six hours. And you can see for hours, for the, most of this experimental run, Skeptobius is on top of the ant doing this grooming behavior. And we think Skeptobius spends an inordinate fraction of its life doing this horizontal acquisition of these cuticular hydrocarbons that have to be permanently, almost perpetually replenished for Skeptobius to maintain this chemical um, mimicry. Um, you can put another insect in this arena and Skeptobius won't be interested in it at all. And this is because we think that the cuticular hydrocarbons on the ant are actually the cues the beetle is homing in on that cause it to detect the ant as something that it wants to groom. So you can actually kill the ant, okay? This is a dead ant here, and Skeptobius will still climb up on top of it and do this grooming behavior. You can then chemically strip that ant by dropping it in hexane and you lose this interaction. Okay, Skeptobius shows no interest in the ant. And then you can reapply those cuticular hydrocarbons, the ant's cuticular hydrocarbons, back onto the dead ant corpse and you reconstitute the interaction. So Skeptobius, this socially parasitic beetle, has evolved to detect ant CHCs Okay, this kind of pulls it towards the end, so it executes this grooming behavior, and then it wants to take those CHCs, apply it, them to its own body, so that it can smell like an ant and live permanently inside these colonies. Skeptobius is even more kind of clever than that because it's clued into other aspects of the ant chemistry. So in addition to the cuticular hydrocarbons, there's another set of compounds the ants produce, which are called iridoids, have a kind of structure like this. Um, these are the ants' trail pheromones. So when those when limatobin forms these huge 100-meter um, trails across the landscape, it's laying down these iridoid trail pheromones. And you can extract these ke chemicals specifically and paint them into arenas and see what Skeptobius does. And you see this wonderful circle walking behavior where Skeptobius religiously follows these iridoid trail pheromones. We think that the beetle is eavesdropping on these chemicals to enable it to disperse across the landscape and move between colonies, enabling gene flow to happen. So Skeptobius is just this most wonderful, kind of remarkable symbiotic organism. It's evolved to eavesdrop on the ant's cuticular hydrocarbons, these nest mate recognition cues that it's using to recognize the ant and it wants to steal these cues so it can then pretend that it is an ant inside a colony. And it's also um, clued in to the ant's iridoid trail pheromones that enable it to um, disperse across the landscape while maintaining a permanent um, association with the single host ant species. The Skeptobus is just one single example of this. There are myriad other organisms associated with limatopum ants and ants in general, which are probably doing this and making a living from these colonies. So it's really essential that we get to grips with ants and the role they play as keystone organisms within terrestrial ecosystems. We need to know about not just their own biology, but the ecological communities they control. And we also need to understand how ants are gonna to respond to anthropogenic changes like climate change and the introduction of invasive species. It's very difficult to study these processes in a way that you might study a population of plants or a population of ma mammals, for example. Because ants are so small, they're so numerous, and quantifying ant characteristics at an ecosystem scale is really, really challenging. We want to be able to do things like understand how climate will affect the collective behaviors of ants. We want to understand how their interactions with other species are impacted by human disturbances. And we want to be able to predict how the introduction of invasive species is going to disrupt or um, 
otherwise impair the functioning of these ant colonies, which are so intrinsic to the habitats that they live in. So one kind of worrisome aspect to, 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 uh, of Limatopum, which just to repeat is the kind of dominant native ant of Southern California is the presence of the Argentine ant, which are those very small black ants that you find kind of ubiquitously in urban areas. They have displaced Limatopum ants from virtually every kind of um, uh, um, uh, ha habitat except um, along the, up to this boundary that um, cuts through the Angeles National Forest. Okay, so this is kind of northward spread of the Argentine ant, this super col colony forming ant um, that um, uh, Limatopum succumbs to. And we want to be able to understand what it is about colonies of Limatopum ants in some parts of the forest that make them resilient to the uh, presence of this invasive species. And so to address all of these kinds of questions, what my lab is moving towards is, is, is taking our experiments out of the lab and back into the field and using machine learning and vision techniques to try and quantify ant behavior at scale. And so one of the things that we've done in collaboration with uh, Michael Dickinson's lab, which is a neighboring lab that studies insect behavior, is to, is to develop a field deployable machine vision camera that we can use to measure and quantify ant behavior, potentially at a landscape scale. So this camera um, is pretty incredible. Um, it enables you to um, uh, image uh, colonies of ants. You can deploy it at, you know, um, at scale, large numbers of these cameras. Um, and at the, it will send um, uh, data back to Caltech via um, the cell network, and it also measures things like temperature, humidity, um, and ambient light. Okay, so it's recording all of these environmental variables. We've managed to get it down to a cost of about $200. That means it's scalable to many units. And so what we're in the process of doing now is actually optimizing this camera to be able to track ant behavior at large scale. So this is a, a camera that we've mounted at the uh, nest entrance of a colony in Angeles National Forest. Um, and two students, Tarun Sharma and Julian Wagner, who are shared between uh, my lab and Michael Dickinson's lab, developed um, a machine vision protocol to be able to track the numbers and movements of ants in the field of view of this camera. Okay, so they use an object detection neural network to be able to identify the ants. And then they're able to use um, uh, the tracks of the ants, the trajectories of the ants to maintain the identities of the objects, these ants, as they move across the field of view. And this is the kind of thing that you do, you can get by deploying this camera, this kind of long term monitoring of large chunks of these colonies at things like nest entrances and foraging trails and areas where they're feeding on honeydew. And so by taking these technologies out of the lab and de deploying them into the field, what we're trying to do is understand how ant collective behavior and ecological interactions are going to be influenced by things like climate and the presence of other species um, with the goal of being able to quantify ant collective behavior at the landscape scale. So that's um, kind of one of the directions that our lab is moving in to kind of integrate ants as this keystone social life force as a, 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 like a quantifiable ecological variable. Okay, so I'm going to end here. I'm going to return to our nice picture of planet Earth. And I hope I've persuaded you that there's really this alternative lens for viewing our planet as being this ant-shaped biosphere where really everything that we see around us that's living has passed through this ant-shaped selective filter over the past 50 million years. And if we're really going to get to grips with sustainability and maintaining a functional and healthy biosphere, it's organisms like ants and the species that they interact with that we really have to pay attention to. I will stop there and thank you all for listening. Um, I'd like to thank uh, um, a couple of students in my lab who um, provided some of the data I showed you in this talk, my collaborator and neighbor, Michael Dickinson, um, Will Dixon, who's um, uh, an engineer in his lab who developed the field deployable camera, 
and Tarun Sharma, who was involved in developing the machine vision protocol to track um, colony level ant behavior. And I'd like to thank um, various entities, organizations and bodies um, and centers that have funded the work in my lab. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. That is absolutely fascinating. And to our viewers on this seminar day, please post your questions in the Q&A box on the right. We already have many coming in and they're fascinating. So we're gonna jump into that in a moment. And I wanna remind you when you post your question or thought, give us your geographical location, if you will, and year of graduation and major because at Caltech, we're always interested in that. So Joe, I think we'll go, we'll start with some technical questions and then move to the broader philosophical one that I think mm -hmm. really occurs to us as we're listening. I think that this is going back to the malaise trap early in the beginning of your um, talk. I think Xiu Xian Ling, and apologies if I butcher one's name as I'm saying that, BS 83, yay, biology MD from U Texas, coming from Phoenix, Arizona, w was interested in, in sort of the reduction of those insects. Might, is some of the reduction of insects related to the spray of chemtrails or insecticides? There's some rumination that maybe in, in parts of Germany the chem, the, that was prevalent. Um, and then also just in the same question, I think about that trap, David Fleischer asked, uh, is the bias biomass in the trap, is that the overall daily catch or the average mass of each individual? So a little more oh, than that, I think. I, I can answer the second question first. It, okay. it, it, it's the total daily catch, yeah. So it's not like individual insects are getting lighter, it's like the total bulk catch of insects is, is reducing. Um, uh, so, so number of? Uh, no, no, the, the weight, the total right. weight, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So okay. it's a crude me metric, but it's, I think still very compelling, the trend. Yes. Um, so uh, as to this, the first question, yes, like the use of pesticides is certainly a contributing factor. Um, so yeah, you know, agricultural practices and especially intensive ones that use large amounts of pesticides for sure is gonna be detrimental to insects and, and presumably, you know, is contributing to the decline in Germany and elsewhere in, in, in the world, definitely. And I, and I think there's a, a, a question um, from Eduardo Kutolenk also, um, and I think that many are curious about this. Are there any differences in the biomass of the insects collected in these capture tests when they're collected in human inhabited areas versus uninhabited wild areas? Do you yes. So, so yes and no. So the, the effects, the declines are most pronounced in uh, areas which are... Um, you know, adjacent to urbanization, urbanized areas, uh, or are, are in agricultural settings. But the really alarming thing is there are also re reductions that have been um, observed in what we think of as pristine ecosystems. These are tropical rainforests that have never been felled. So, you know, across the board, there's evidence for declines and it's penetrating into intact habitats too. And in terms of the increase and decrease, Jonah Michaud, BS93 Physics, who's coming to us from McMinnville, Oregon, um, are ant populations still increasing increasing on a global scale? Or are the numbers of species of ants increasing or decreasing? That's a great question. So um, there's about 14,000 species of ants. Um, and I would say that and, and, you know, people have done this kind of back of the envelope calculation to, you know, determine how, what the mass of all of those ants is. Um, and they find that it's, I think, something like 70 million tons and there's maybe 60 million tons of humans on Earth. I actually skipped through that slide earlier. But <laughs> um, but 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 um, uh, in terms of the actual species composition, I would say that most native ant species are, are probably negatively affected or show no change. Um, the flip side of this is that like ants are some of the most kind of, you know, devastating invasive species that we've unleashed into, you know, the naive ecosystems. And so, you know, all of, you know, the um, LA County is dominate is kind of an insect desert. 
because of the Argentine ant, which has just decimated it, you know, native insect life here. You know, fire ant populations in Florida and Texas, an analogous phenomenon. Yellow crazy ants in island ecosystems. Um, you know, there are lots of these examples of ants that form these super colonies that, you know, really transform entire ecosystems. And of course, the abundance of those is, you know, growing exponentially, you know, probably to the detriment of native ant species. And so, you know, ants like Limatopum, the one that the native ant that we study, it's vanishing from, you know, the habitats around here and the entire assemblage of organisms that depend on it. Yeah, and I think to that point, very concerning that our velvety tree ant of Pasadena is being overtaken by the Argentine ants, Tad Hog, BS79 physics, yay, uh, close to my year, PhD Stanford, now from Mountain View, California. Um, you know, to that point, how do new ant colonies find territory among the existing colonies? Um, uh, uh, Tad was wondering, do new ones have to wait until others are destroyed, for example, by fire? Or yeah. Well, or yeah. So, so most ant colonies uh, reproduce by creating large numbers of reproductive, reproductive. So, it's just winged queens and males, which then fly out of the colony. You often mate in the air, and then the male dies. You know, that's all he's good for, really. Um, and and uh, the female, the foundress, has to find a new place to. Um, you know, found a, found a nest. And often, you know, she'll just be killed, right? She won't be able to find, you know, a, 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 new, a new nesting site. This is why colonies produce an excess of queens, because the majority of them probably turn into bird food and things like this. Um, but if a queen is lucky, she'll find a very isolated place and produce what's called a claustral chamber, which is a kind of sealed chamber. And she'll, she'll lay her first eggs. They'll um, hatch out into really tiny workers called nanitics, which carry out the first tasks of this nascent colony. Okay, the first forays out of this claustral cell. Um, they'll bring some resources back and, you know, feed the queen and she'll produce, you know, a second cohort of workers, which are larger. And, you know, with some luck, she can reach a kind of threshold colony size where she can hold her own and compete against you know, other ants in, the, in, 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 in neighboring ant colonies. Um, but it's very precarious. And this is why ants tend to produce large numbers of offspring, many of which will just perish. So uh, one more question from Eduardo, which is interesting. Could, could a synthetic pheromone be created that mimics a repellent pheromone for these invasive ant species to help remove or control the ant populations rather than using traditional pesticides? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in theory, this is one of the reasons we need to know much more about ant chemical ecology to be able to do that in a way which is, you know, t very targeted. One of the um, challenging aspects is that ants often share different compounds uh, across species. So you might find a native ant species that use, you know, responds to one of these iridoid trail pheromones too. And so it's quite hard to make sure that you're going to... Um, uh, carry out some intervention like that in an ecologically safe way. One of the interesting approaches is to try and use some of these um, parasitic organisms, which, you know, um, target ant colonies, which are very, very, you know, ant species specific. And there was a, 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 a pro this what still is a, a project at UT Austin, which is using these ant decapitating flies that lay their eggs into fire ants and the larva pupates in, in, inside the head capsule and it decapitates the ant. And they've managed to suppress populations of fire ants this way, but it's very um, intensive and requires augmenting, you know, growing up large numbers of these flies and releasing them almost continuously. But there's potential there, both for chemistry and these organismal interventions. Last question, we're gonna go philosophical, and I think it's fascinating Great. to answer the global social force, but they're also, they're social, but also innately hostile. Mm -hmm. And um, as Hu Xian Ling uh, from uh, Phoenix, Arizona asks, okay, and so this is for you to go wide. It seems to me there are parallels to how a balanced local ecosystem can be disrupted by outside invasive species how previously balanced neighboring countries can be unbalanced by a non-neighboring invasive country. There's the current dire situ situation between the Ukraine and Russia. 
uh, etc. Um, so I, I guess in 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 the and to maintain a local ecology, like should there be more symbiosis in a certain sense? Um, and I guess it is for you to go for a moment. I, I guess we're all sort of relating ants to humans in a way. Yeah. Is there any phil philosophy that you can pull? Yeah. From I mean, the analogies you know? are the analogies. That's just so real between humans and ants. They are these complex societies. Um, which are also also have vulnerabilities. Um, they're exploited by, you know, in, in, in the case of human social parasites and in the case of ant social parasites. Um, and they are beneficial for organisms that can kind of strike mutualistic partnerships. And so they can live harmoniously, you know, if these trade deals are in place. And so, you know, you can learn a lot about the stability of both you know, societies and ecosystems at large from studying ants, which are really a sort of microcosm for, you know, the complicated social structures that you see um, in our own species. So, yeah, yeah I, 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 this is one of the reasons that I think, you know, we should be focused on this because we can learn a lot of lessons from them. And many of us will be a lot when when it goes into the jam jar in the kitchen. I I, I won't be spraying Windex all over them anymore. I, I think you can because it's probably the Argentine ant. We want to get rid of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you so much, Joe Parker, for our ant shaped planet. And thanks to you viewers for all your great questions. Keep them coming. Um, we're going to take a short break, and we'll see you at 11 a.m. for the Art of Science Communication. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you.